Before I start, I would like to share one more incident of Chef Intyaz Qureshi's creativity, which highlights a chef's contribution to the culinary, to the food industry in general. The year was 1986, and Mr. Madhurao Sindhya's daughter's wedding was to take place in Gwalior. I was given the responsibility to lead the team and organize the function, and Chef Intyaz Qureshi was my chef. You may not remember, 1986 was the days of Gas Control Act. Gas Control Act means if there are more than 100 people in a party, you cannot serve cereals. Means no rice, no flour, none of these things. You cannot serve sugar. You cannot serve desert sweetened with sugar. And we were told to make a banquet by fitting 100 royalties from India who will be attending the daughter's wedding. Chef Sintyaz Qureshi created a menu which had biryani, naan, parathas, and desserts and kept himself within the limits of the law. It went to that extent that the press refused to believe that we have not violated the law and the biryani they are eating has to be rice. It tasted rice, it looked rice. We refused to divulge the secret. They threatened to go to the media and publish it. We challenged them to do that because we knew Chef Intyaz Qureshi's creativity. There was no rice in the biryani. There was no sugar in the deserts. And there was no wheat flour in the naan and parathas. I leave it to your guesswork how we managed that miracle but my hat's off to the creativity of the man. <laughs> Great job, Chef. Always remembered for the new trends he has given to the industry. We talk of food trends. Food trends can be food fads also. What came as froth in the soup is slowly wearing away. What came as the nouvelle cuisine got lost. Ultimately, the trend is what customer accepts and is willing to pay for it. North Indian food, the food, Mughalai food, for which we are all known so well, has transformed itself from heavy ghee-laden food to less fat or no visible fat. Dampukt is an example of such a cooking where you do not see any fat at all on the food. It's absolutely without visible fat. So these things will continue. I think the major issue is, is customer willing to pay for it? Today we are talking about close to the nature, organic food, yes. It is health related, it will become popular if we can create enough food, quality and quantity of such food which can easily be available and assured that this quality will remain. There was a very nice mention in Prime Minister's speech on 15th of August. He raised the point of zero defect and zero effect. I think that sums up the expectations from the restaurants also, any food related business. Customer expects zero defect food. There is no second chance in our industry. It has to be right first time, every time. There are no concessions. There are no discounts to be given if the food is bad. He will not eat it. He will not come back for it. I know effect means you have to be socially conscious. Environments are important. Recently, I attended WAX conference, World Association of Chefs Conference in Norway. And one of the major subjects there was chef's social responsibilities in the given context. Is my job is only to make food and sell food? Or am I also responsible for the ecology, for the environments? Because chef around the world are biggest creator of food and food is nature's gift. 
And if we do not work in tune with the nature, there won't be enough food left for us. It could be fish in the rainy season. It could be unethical use of uh, vegetables or any other product for that matter. So chef remains constantly responsible uh, to address the, the global needs in terms of environment and taste. The QSRs, yes, are becoming prominent. People have less time. Office hours are given breaks for lunches, quick meals, or you are shopping in the market and you want to have a quick bite. QSRs are suddenly coming in the way. They take much less space. They take much less staff. And since the menus are small generally, they need very little training. So they will stand the test of time because they are reflecting the, t the demands of today's staffing, costs, overheads, etc. The other aspect which we are touching today in our panel discussion is the human resource. How to retain human resource and how to motivate them. The hospitality industry is labor intensive industry. For every one customer, nine people are employed around in various functions. And howsoever technology you might have, ultimate human contact is going to be there. The food cannot be prepared by robots, has to be prepared by chefs. Food will be served. There are some hotels, restaurants created in the world now where food is brought by conveyor belts. It is dropped on your table. But those are freak instances. Ultimately, the human resource is going to be your main factor. Today's human resource is volatile, is mobile. It wants to grow faster. It wants rewards faster. It has needs and demands. And the industry has to somehow meet those demands. And therefore, constant growth opportunities for your staff are going to remain integral challenge of any business. Motivation, money is the least motivator of all the motivating factors. We all understand that. All salaries somehow catch up with the expenses and we are never enough salaries. People work for various other reasons. People will work for you if they are happy with you and if they are growing with you. There is a small incident in a kitchen when a general manager is walking through the kitchen he sees a chef has made, one of the cooks has made a very nice dish. He pats him on the back and says, well done. The GM thinks he has done his job, motivated the staff. The staff says, excuse me, sir. You just patted my back. Thank you very much. But what is it worth? What will it get me? The general manager is taken aback. He says, I thought I motivated you. He says, yeah, but when the time for increment comes, you see, I tried my best, but I don't decide it. The owners decide it. The board decides it. He says, in that case, sir, why should I work to please you? If you're not my direct benefactor, then why should I try to please you? Your path is worthless for me. It was a very challenging point and it had to be addressed. So the staff was called to the office of the general manager and then he explained him. I said, I agree. I cannot give you promotions or increments because they are governed by certain rules and certain budgetary constraints. There may not be enough vacancies where I can promote you and there may not be enough money left in the business to keep on giving you the increments which you want. But I got one job, which I am doing very well, and I guarantee I'll keep on doing, is to make you promotable. That is the challenge of today's manager also. You may not be able to give the promotion or the increment staff deserves, but you can get him ready for the job when it comes. He should be promotable. And therefore, the emphasis on training, continuous training and development of the staff, I personally feel that's the biggest motivator factor you can give to any employee if he can see that his, his skills, his talent, 
is being recognized and developed further for higher responsibilities. And um, beyond that, staff will move. That's the normal process. And therefore, the training institutes become your another essential part of your requirement. The industry must understand that continuous supply of trained staff is very essential, which cannot be done in-house all the time. And therefore, it is the responsibility of the industry to support, participate, and work together with the training institutes, give your knowledge, give your time, give your commitment, so that when the staff comes out of those training institutes, is the industry ready? It doesn't have to go through training all over again. Once they're industry ready, you can replenish your staff without much problem. With this note, I'll thank you very much. and look forward to your questions. Thank you.